Since the Industrial Revolution started, the average global sea level has risen by almost a foot, and the rate is growing too. The current rate of sea level rise sits at about three times what it was in the early 1900s. As shown on this graph, 12 centimeters of water have been added to the Earth's oceans since 1980. Though this may seem like a trivial amount, the world's coasts are made up of incredibly important and vulnerable areas. According to one report, by 2050, more than $100 billion worth of coastal property will be underwater, and flooding could lead to $1 trillion per year in damages if expensive mitigation measures are not adopted. Contrary to common perception, there is not one singular source of sea level rise. Since the 1980s, the most common factors leading to higher water levels are thermal expansion of the upper ocean, thermal expansion of the deep ocean, melting of the world's 200,000 mountain glaciers, mass loss from Greenland and other ar Arctic ice sheets, and changes in the water stored on land. While Greenland might not, may not be the primary source of historical sea level rise, it is currently the fastest accelerating contributor to sea level, and if melted, would add about 7 meters of water worldwide. Overall, sea level rise is an issue that is gaining severity quickly, thanks in part to the increased melting of the Greenland ice sheet. It is because of this that understanding the processes governing how Greenland is changing and how, may, how it may contribute to sea level in the future is critical. The issue of sea level rise is one with worldwide implications, and the Greenland ice sheet is a big part of the issue. With 1.7 million square kilometers of ice that can reach up to 3,000 meters deep, the ice has the ability to add about seven and a half meters of water to global average sea level. In other words, if all ice was added to oceans as water, global average sea level would rise by about 7.4 meters. To understand the massive scale of such a statement, we first need to do some conversions. One gigaton of ice is equal to about one cubic kilometer of ocean water. Knowing that the total area of the world's oceans is about 362 million square kilometers, to raise global sea levels a full millimeter, 362 gigatons of ice need to be added to the ocean. Every winter, the entire island of Greenland is covered in snow. The amount of snow varies by place, with the low, wet south averaging several meters of precipitation, and the high and dry interior of the ice sheet only receiving half a meter or so of new snow. Overall, about 700 gigatons of water equivalent in new snow are added to the ice sheet every year, or about two millimeters of sea level equivalent. Greenland may be gaining mass every winter, but each summer it loses mass too. It does this in two ways. Melt, where snow and ice turn into water and run off into the ocean, and calving, where the tongue of the glacier will reach the ocean and shed ice into the water. In recent decades, the sum of mass loss from runoff and calving combined have exceeded the mass gain from snowfall. In other words, the ice sheet has been losing far more mass each year than it gains. This plot shows the cumulative mass loss from the Greenland ice sheet from 1980 to 2018. Cumulative mass in gigatons is shown on the left axis, and total sea level contribution in millimeters is shown on the right. The light green represents surface mass balance, or melt. Light blue is mass loss from dynamic processes, or calving, and dark blue shows the total of the two. Notice how early in the record, the ice sheet was in balance and had about the same input and output each year. This period had melt and calving, but any mass lost was replaced in full by snowfall during the winter. After this period, though, the calving rate began to increase and the ice sheet began to lose mass. Eventually, the melt rate began to accelerate too, soon exceeding the mass lost from calving. This loss contributes to sea level rise. By the end of the record shown on this plot, the ice sheet began to lose substantial mass from the two processes, about 4,000 gigatons of ice or more than one centimeter of sea level rise in about a decade. As one of the two major sources of ice loss on the ice sheet, calving only happens in surprisingly few areas where the ice moves down a fjord and meets with the ocean. Seen here as brighter colors, areas with calving can be shown with speed maps. Quickly moving ice needs somewhere to go, and in this case, that place is as an iceberg in the ocean. Melt, the other major source of ice loss, happens in a much more broad area, though it is more common in some places than others. Melt typically happens in the most outer regions of the ice, where elevations are the lowest, but can reach high up onto the ice sheet. Areas where the elevation is highest, around 10,000 feet above sea level, 
receive little to no melt each year. Melt areas vary highly, changing from day to day and year to year. Though the outer meltwater runs off the ice sheet into the ocean, it is important to note that not all of it does. The Greenland ice sheet experiences variable melt throughout the year, with total melt area changing between days all summer long. Here, we can see daily measurements of the melt area on the ice sheet as measured by satellites. Note that the satellite radar only measures if snow is wet or dry, so it can only measure the area of snow melting, not the amount. Here is another view of that data, with this plot showing the total melt area on the y-axis and time of year on the x. Generally, peak melt occurs during mid-July, but can migrate around the summer season as storm cycles and local weather differ. Though there is high variability between years, some trends can be seen as time passes. On average, melt is observed on the ice sheet for more days each year and covers more area than it did even just a few decades ago. Melt events are getting more extreme too, with more melt area associated with warmer weather patterns. Even though melt varies highly, these trends have stayed true during recent years. The largest melt event recorded so far is pictured here, where on July 12, 2012, the entire ice sheet experienced surface melting conditions. As warming continues, we can expect more days with melt, as well as increases in surface melt area and intensity. Though melt can occur anywhere on the ice sheet, it is most commonly recorded near the low edges of the ice. Higher elevations do not experience nearly as much melt, so they are continuously covered by snow. These high elevations of the ice sheet are where glacial ice forms and where snow builds up year after year. As winter-long layers of snow fall on top of each other, the older layers slowly become more compact and dense. Snow layers are able to compact as the pore space between individual grains of snow is compressed by the weight of overlying snow layers. At the same time, the sharp edges of each grain of snow become more rounded and the grains begin to grow together. Over time, this process continues and snow transforms into solid glacier ice. Snow that has begun to compact but is not yet glacier ice is called fern. The full transition process takes years and the fern layer near the center of the ice sheet can be close to 90 meters thick before it finally becomes glacier ice. Ice formed at the center of the ice sheet sinks from the weight of the ice forming on top of it and then flows out into the margins of the ice sheet. The area where annual snowfall exceeds the annual melt is called the accumulation zone and accounts for any new ice formed each year. The lower elevation zone where all winter snowfall melts is called the ablation zone. The ablation zone is responsible for a range of melt amounts, where at the bottom all snow plus a substantial amount of ice melts and where at the top all snow plus very little ice is melted. The ice that melts here is constantly replenished by ice flowing from the accumulation zone. Even in a situation where the ice sheet is not losing mass and sustains a steady mass balance, there should be substantial melt along the edges of the ablation zone. Enough melt that with melt and cabin combined, all of the snow that builds up across the vast accumulation zone should be balanced by loss below. This meltwater from the ablation zone quickly makes its way to the ocean. Near the center of the accumulation zone, where elevations reach well over 10,000 feet, snow remains cold and dry throughout the year. This area is called the dry snow zone and experiences very little to no melt at all during the summer months. Along the outer edges of the accumulation zone, where elevations are lower and relatively warm ocean waters are closer, the fern layer experiences high melt during the summer. This is called the percolation zone. The fate of meltwater generated across the percolation zone is unclear. High on the percolation zone, melt is minimal and the underlying snow layer is cold so any surface melt seeps into the fern layer below and quickly refreezes. Low on the percolation zone, though, heavy melting occurs and the entire fern layer is saturated with water. Here, excess melt water flows off the ice sheet and joins the ocean. In between these two end members, the fate of melt is unclear. There must be a runoff limit below which water runs off into the ocean and above which the water is retained within the ice sheet. The ultimate fate of meltwater that is generated by surface melt in the percolation zone is further complicated by the formation of ice layers. During summer melt months, the surface of the ice sheet becomes saturated with meltwater. Some melt infiltrates into the underlying snow, 
where it can form horizontal layers of water-saturated snow. During the ensuing winter, this water and any slush at the surface freeze, becoming a solid ice layer. The meltwater of subsequent years can experience difficulty bypassing these ice layers and pools on top of the old summer surface. Impounded water only thickens the buried ice layer. There are multiple possible situations that could occur when meltwater encounters ice layers. The first of these is that all subsequent melt is routed off the ice sheet by lateral flow along buried ice layers. Here, water does not penetrate deeply and the deep fern keeps open pore space. So, another possible scenario is that the highly irregular thickness and spatial continuity of the ice layers allows for water to leak through. This would mean that meltwater is able to flow deeper into the ice sheet and to be retained in the open pore space of the fern layer. Though it may seem trivial, these two contrasting scenarios highlight a major scientific problem related to Greenland's mass balance and its present and future contributions to sea level rise. We have observations and models that provide detailed information about the location, timing, and the amount of surface melt across the ice sheet, but we lack a sufficient understanding of the fate of meltwater in the percolation zone. We don't know how much meltwater runs off into the ocean and how much seeps into open pore space in the fern layer and is retained on the ice sheet. This uncertainty generates two major questions that require scientific research to answer in order to improve projections of sea level rise. First, where is the runoff limit now? And next, how is the addition of increasing meltwater causing a transformation of the fern layer that will alter migration of the runoff limit and future retention and runoff? Answering these questions is the subject of a major research project funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation.